before you put your phone down, please make sure you're subscribed and rate and review. Go on, give us a quick rating and a review. It doesn't take long. Also, today's guest has his own podcast. His name's Kyle Tierman. So go ahead and look up his podcast while you've got your phone there. K-Y-L-E-T-H-I-E-R-M-A-N-N, The Kyle Tierman Show. As well as being a podcaster, he's also a pro surfer and a filmmaker. And in today's interview, he shares some gold. Enjoy. So why single fins? Single fins force me to slow down. And my big issue in surfing and life has always been that I move too quickly. One of my favorite things about getting older is that I am realizing the joy of slowing down. I'm realizing the joy of drinking in life slowly and enjoying a wave slowly. I sometimes feel like the purpose of my life is simply to notice more and single fans allow me to do that. And I think that every time I ride a single fan, it forces me to think about my bottom turn, which is the fundamental of surfing. And I can't <clears throat> cheat with a triple bottom turn. And I think that one of the big mistakes I made early on in surfing was that I tried to rip too early. And I was riding these little boards and I was growing up as a Grom in Santa Cruz with a great talent pool um, of surfers. I grew up with Nat Young and a guy named Kyle Boothman, who's now a well-known filmmaker and also a really good surfer. And I have always felt like I was two steps behind them. So I was always trying to catch up. I was always trying to learn the next trick. And as a result, my surfing really suffered because I didn't slow down and focus on the fundamentals first. So a single fin allows you to focus on the fundamentals more by slowing things down. Yeah. Um, what does it force you to slow down? How do, what do you mean by slow down? Because well, I thought good surfing was fast surfing. Um. No, good surfing is graceful surfing, I think. And, uh, like, you need to... It, surfing is a sport where you are pushing against the wave and the wave is pushing back. And depending on the craft that you're using, you're going to be able to push um, with different pressure and different angles. So the single fin forces me to push and think think about where I am positioned on the wave to generate speed more than gyrating which you can do on a, a thruster and it's just fun it's groovy i feel cool when i ride a single fan yeah yeah tuck that back knee in just go straight right, i'll go i'll go on a wave i won't even do a turn i'll just go straight the whole way my friend will be like what'd you do on that wave I'm like nothing it was the best wave ever interesting so so if it, it sounds like the for you the progression in surfing is noticing more of what's happening when you're surfing yeah, um, yeah. It's it's noticing more what about what's happening and noticing more about myself. I think that surfing is this this great mirror for myself. Um, it shows me where I'm doing good in life. It shows me where I'm doing bad. Uh, surfing big waves is a, a huge mirror for myself. I mean, there's no faking it when you get pulled down by a big wave either you're going to be able to stay composed in that situation or you're not and i really love those kinds of moments and it doesn't need to be a big wave that allows for a huge amount of reflection to happen but anything where i um any kind of newness you know i, I would like in surfing different kinds of boards with traveling it gets you out of your comfort zone. All of a sudden, you're seeing a new street halfway around the world, and you're realizing, oh, this isn't, this isn't my street. It forces me to constantly think and keep my mind going. and It's one of the best parts of life. How would you describe your relationship with surfing? Uh, it's, it's like a, an abusive relationship. <laughs> I think that... Um, 
I think that I have gained a much better relationship with surfing in the past few years as I've sought out um, some mentors. Um, and I've... <clears throat> I've really l surfing mentors. Surfing mentors, yeah, yeah. I th I think that um, I always, from a young age, I I had this false belief that if I got to a certain level of surfing, then I would be okay with my surfing. Like, oh, once I learn air reverses, then I'll be okay. Oh, once I learn how to do a really good cutback, then I'll be okay. But it was um, largely a, like. Like I was seeking something and trying to get better, but it wasn't. Tr I wasn't trying to get better purely from a place of curiosity. It was from this place of like, a, I'll show them. Like I'm gonna get good. Like I had this kind of chip on my shoulder, um, and created adversarial relationships in my life that probably didn't really exist. And as a result, I'd be really hard on myself. Like I remember being like 14, 15 years old, like losing in an NSSA contest and just feeling like it was the end of the world. Like my sense of self was shattered as a result. And I look back at that and I, I laugh at, at those situations now. Um, but it's been, it, I think that now what noticing more has done for my surfing is, is it's allowed me to make smaller circles. So if I now um, am surfing a, a wave like Puerto Escondido, um, where, and if you're surfing Puerto Escondido, there are a lot of closeout barrels that you get. Um, I, if I fall in that barrel, I try and dissect what I did wrong. And it's not so much the thought, I am a bad surfer now as a result of falling in that, on that wave. It's, okay, what did I do wrong? And I think that the best, um, the best surfers are the ones that can kind of look at, at, surfing through a sober lens they look at their own surfing through a, a sober lens and and same with comics you know you look at the best comics they're not they are willing to look at a set they went on on a stage they bombed they're able to dissect it and say okay what did i do wrong how can i do something different and if we're able to take our ego out of the craft and it's this constant push and pull with the ego right then that's what allows us to get better and that sober lens, is that often um, reviewing the footage? I wish I could review footage more, man. I I always benefit so much from uh, that. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> watching footage of, of myself surfing is like, uh, it's probably the equivalent of like going out and going on a date with a girl and thinking like, oh, I did so good. I was killing it. It was amazing. And then you like listen to the audio and you're like, oh, man wasn't exactly how I thought it would be. Have you have you recorded a few dates? No, I, <laughs> I still haven't been able to to pull that one off. But um, I felt like my surfing uh, got a lot better. In there have been three stages in in my surfing. If I really want to like look at where I feel like um, I got a lot better, um, and began to really enjoy it more. The first was when I started taking trips uh, with a, a good friend of mine named Kyle Boothman. Um, he's a, an incredible tube rider, and we spend a lot of time down in Mexico surfing beach breaks. And before that point, I had never really surfed heavy waves. Santa Cruz is a spot that has a lot of point breaks, and we do get heavy days, but um, by and large, you're not surfing a barreling wave. And he invited me to come down on a few of these trips. And I had never seen waves that did what they did in a wave like, in a spot like Port Escondido. I had never seen waves that moved at that speed and demanded that kind of fast thinking. Um, and we brought a photo uh, filmer down there with us on those first trips. And I noticed that a big mistake I was making early on was... Um, I would drop in straight to the waves and then I would bottom turn to try and pull up into the barrel and the wave would have passed me by. So after reviewing days and days of footage and, and you know, dropping into waves and not even making it into the barrel, I figured out, okay, to surf these kinds of waves, I need to get on a rail and really push it from the, the second that I drop in the wave, I need to be getting to the shoulder. And I also really need to be... Um, noticing the waves more. I need to be reading the waves and 
if there's any kind of um, chunder on the lip on the inside, it's going to be a closeout barrel. So the, the amount of just messing up and then trying to read the waves better and looking at the footage, um, it opened up this whole new door for me, which is um, surfing heavier waves. And what I really like about surfing heavier waves is that um, it just raises the stakes a bit. Um, and I, you know, when, before I started surfing, I uh, wanted to be a pro skater. And um, skateboarding is a sport where you have a lot of consequences on a daily basis. If you're trying to hurl yourself over a 10 stair, um, like you really don't want to fall too many times. And there is also that moment of deciding that you're going to do it. It's kind of just that like, okay, screw it. We're going to make it happen. We're doing this. So I had that, that mindset from an early age, but technically speaking, I always felt like I was a few steps behind, um, my friends, uh, who were you know, doing air reverses at, at 13 years old, and I was I still couldn't figure out how to make it happen. But then when I started going down to these heavy beach breaks, um, I felt like I was able to use my strengths from skateboarding more and, f and simplify the process. And, man, on... On one of those early trips, I don't even think I made it out of a barrel. <laughs> one of the first trips that I went on to Puerto Escondido, I came home with my tail between my legs. But then it fascinated me so much that I um, I came back and that first experience of getting a proper big barrel where you, you drop in and you're standing in this room of water and to feel the air backspit like that was something that I had never experienced before where the air sucks in the vortex goes and then that was a special experience for me um, and when that happened I felt like okay I've I found something that's going to be keeping me here for a really long time so all, the, <clears throat> all that hard work was worth it all those close out barrels well yeah you need to learn I mean it's <laughs> you need to learn how to enjoy the process, right? And uh, some, there are a lot of waves um, around our world that demand a huge amount of patience. Um, we spend weeks of our lives um, working for seconds of pleasure. And especially at these these big beach breaks where um, you can be sitting out there for three hours and not even paddle into a wave. Either you're going to be into that kind of stuff or you're not. And being an impatient person, I find that it's really good for me to put myself in those situations and force myself to be patient and force myself to notice more. You know, I keep coming back to, to Puerto because I do think that it, it's it is a wave that has just taught me so much even when i'm not riding waves sitting out in the lineup noticing where a rip starts forming and then thinking okay if this rip is is sucking right here there might be a set that that shows up 10 minutes later so it's this constant cat and mouse game in puerto and you see someone um like Greg Long, who's or Rusty Long, those guys are some of the best at Puerto Escondido. They're constantly noticing what is happening up and down the beach, and it's not by chance that they tend to get the best waves of the day. It's because they're constantly noticing, even when they're not riding a wave. They're figuring out where the rips are happening. They're s checking the day before to see where the bars are forming because it's a wave where new bars pop up and disappear every single day. And that kind of stuff's super cool to me. So they're never just sitting out the back, lost in thought, waiting for a set. They're constantly looking, what's the tide doing? Where's the rips? Looking at the horizon, looking for any sort of signal for that wave they're waiting for. Yeah, it seems like it. Um, Is that how you would describe your experience of sitting out the back? Um, or are you just lost in thought? 
you try not to be lost in thought because then you get a big wave on the head if you're not paying attention. But it's funny, like surfing heavier waves is uh, an experience where you're sitting for a really long time and then uh, there's this moment of intensity that comes at any moment, at, at any point. It's, it's kind of like hunting. Mm. Like hunting is a really boring experience for 99% of the time that you're there. You're either sitting or you're walking slowly. And then at any moment, you better be noticing what the wind is doing, where the animal might be. And at any moment, then this this wildly intense experience presents itself. And I think that that's very similar with surfing heavier waves. Hmm. So you've done some hunting. I have, yeah. Hmm. yeah. In the last year, I've uh, become more interested in in hunting. It's... it's um, Something that gets me out into the mountains um, in California. We have beautiful mountains, and uh, I never had the. Um, there was never any impetus for me to go spend time in the mountains. I was always a beach kid, and uh, just in this last year, I had some friends who were getting into bow hunting. And after and doing my podcast, I've had a few hunters on, and I really enjoyed the experience of getting out there. And again, it for it forces me to notice more in a way that I wouldn't if I was just going on a hike. You need to be very quiet when you're hunting. You want to step with your feet in a flat fashion, and you want to constantly be paying attention to what the wind is doing because animals can. S- a lot of the animals that that I um, hunt. Uh, can smell a lot better than they can see. So you always want to remain downwind from them. Um, So there is this process of of constantly feeling and noticing and being attuned to your natural surroundings that is important. Mm. So do you think that that same lesson applies to surfing and that, I mean, you're a great surfer, but uh, so uh, from what you've learned from surfing, has that helped you to... Um, to be a better hunter, to or to pick up hunting quicker than if you hadn't have had that. I think that the best, <clears throat> like the best uh, lesson I can impart for both hunting and surfing is that I try and surround myself with people who are better than me. It, like that single lesson of just okay, if you want to get better at something, spend time with people who have that skill and are willing to teach you. Um, so for me, I've always, like, I constantly just bribe bribe people who I want to get better. I'm like, hey, I'll hook you up with a Patagonia jacket if you teach me how to hunt. Or like, hey, what is it that I can teach you that then will make it worth it for you to teach me? They say that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And um, whether it comes to hunting or surfing, that's what I try and do. Um, so, like for example, when I s- when I became interested in surfing Mavericks uh, a few years ago, I was living with a guy named Tyler Fox, uh, who's he makes it the f- to the final in the Mavericks contest most years, and he's very calculated and he's a very smart big wave surfer. Um, and I just said, Hey man, like, what can I do? He's a, he's a friend of mine. So he was willing to teach me, but I said, like, what can I do that will get you to teach me? Um, because Mavericks is a way too, where you don't want to make too many mistakes. And I could see early on that I have this bad habit of just being like, YOLO, let's make it happen. Woo. We'll send it and learn, learn the hard way. But, uh, it can really cramp your style falling on a big wave out there. And um, I, n- I wanted to do it in a responsible way. Um, and Tyler's a, kind of, Tyler's a guy who trains for big wave surfing, and you, you rarely see him fall. Uh, he's a guy who rides um, nine-foot boards out at Mavericks. He rides some of the smallest boards out there, and he actually surfs the wave. If you see Tyler drop into a wave, he's usually in a very critical spot, and he rides the wave the way it's supposed to be ridden. 
Um, and I've never had any interest in catching the biggest wave ever. Um, m my desire in, in surfing is, and surfing bigger waves is to ride the waves well. Um, and usually I don't do that, but uh, it it really does um, help. It, it has helped to, to have him serve as kind of a mentor for me. And um, learning how to say no. Like that's that's part of it, man. Like it, like I said, the surfing is this this constant mirror for me in my life, where I I'm pushing myself and then I'm learning about myself. Um, I remember an experience last year where the swell was projected to be really big, and uh, Tyler and I usually drive up to Mavericks together. Um, so I, I put my board in his car and. Uh, we, we were driving up early in the morning before the light came up. And it's really difficult to tell how big the waves are at Mavericks before you get out there. Sometimes if you're driving up Highway 1 uh, and it's daytime, you can kind of um, get a good perspective on how big it's going to be that day. But, but a lot of times you're driving up before um, it gets light, so you are... Um, kind of shooting in the dark and we got up there and and there's this bluff that you can look at the waves from um and mavericks is a wave that's really far out and the light was just coming up and when the light started coming up we could see that it was really thick fog it was that kind of fog where you can barely even see the sun it's just that white ball in the distance and um one of the most dangerous things that can happen to you at mavericks is getting washed through the rocks um, and having people not see you. And f fog makes surfing out there um, exponentially more dangerous because you can fall on a wave, get sucked through the rocks, and then no one's going to see you. And I really wanted to surf. There hadn't been uh, a day of, of surfing big waves in a, in a long time. And I was standing there with Tyler, and he said, it's too dangerous. We're not surfing today. And I said, okay. And we turned around and we went home. And sometimes I think that like a lesson like that taught me more about surfing. And I didn't even surf. You know, so learning how to say no uh, and learning how to slow down, as I said, is this kind of thread throughout my life that uh, I'm constantly constantly pushing <laughs> yeah yeah you don't want to have a surf that you'd regret yeah yeah well it can really take it out of you man like if you have a like my one of my biggest fears is being put in a situation that i really haven't prepared for um and having it come back on me you know having someone die uh and having it be my fault like having having their have been something that I could have done, you know, like ha having someone, f whether that's in surfing or in life, someone just put falling down and, uh, shit, I didn't learn CPR shit. I could have, I could have gained that skill from someone else. They could have taught me that, but I was too lazy to learn that skill. Um, so for me at this point, the reason that I love podcasting so much is I get to sit down with people who would never make time otherwise, and I get to ask them questions, and they impart knowledge um, that can be really useful. So you mentioned mentors a couple of times. Yeah. And you obviously mentioned your big wave mentor, or one of them. Have you, do you have any small wave or normal everyday surfing mentors? Absolutely. Um, Tyler is someone who also, Tyler Fox is someone who also is a really good small wave surfer. He was in the top 100 on the QS and um, was right there for a while um, to be able to make it on the, the world tour. Uh, so he teaches me a lot um, in surfing small waves uh, as well. And um, yeah, you know, it kind of, it, it, it ebbs and flows. I feel like sometimes in my my surfing i'm just uh maintaining and just going out more for my own sanity than i am really pushing and progressing um and i find that the times when i really am pushing myself tend to be on surf trips where i'm surfing a new wave 
um, and I'm needing to, you know, as I said, like it's traveling, you're constantly needing to figure out what, um, if you're serving a new wave, it can't just be routine anymore. So I find that whenever I travel, um, I get better at surfing and really hone in on the craft more. And, uh, and you know, it, it probably sounds really simple to, or, or overly simple to say, but like a lot of what I focus on is going back to the basics again and again, um, focusing on my bottom turn, focusing on my wave selection. Um, if, if I can keep those two things in my mind, then I'm probably going to have a better session. Um, slowing down. So when you go on a trip and you learn to surf a new wave, you come back to your home break and surfing's easier? Oh my god, my home break sucks. Damn, I don't even want to surf. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, right. I, when when we focus deeply on any skill, we're going to get better at it. It's like the difference between getting a Spanish tutor once a week and immersing yourself in uh, Nicaragua and living with a family for a month and not speaking any English. You're going to get a lot better when you immerse yourself in that skill. Um, and I've found that, like, for me, if I want to learn a skill quickly, it's better for me to, to, to immerse myself in it for two weeks than it is to um, have this kind of topical learning method. Um, yeah, so that's it. So it, it ebbs and flows. And in Santa Cruz, we have uh, pretty darn good waves in the winter time. So I tend to focus on my surfing more um, then, and uh, and I take trips whenever possible. But yeah, it's it, it's strange, you know, because like I, uh, there is a point when surfing isn't like surfing is not the most important thing in my life. It's a big part of my life, but, um, like, I realized pretty early on that I was not going to be good enough to make it to the world tour and be a, a competitive professional surfer. Uh, and I think that it's important to always have, like, a sober view of, like, how good we really are and when we should start focusing on, on other aspects of our life more that doesn't mean that we need to stop surfing and and largely like as soon as I kind of let that go I've been able to enjoy my surfing a lot more because my identity wasn't as attached to it um like I have no problem saying like yeah that's, I'm I'm a good surfer but you know when I go like just last week I went and surfed um this beach break up north in Santa Cruz um with Nat Young and just to see his approach, we're surfing the exact same wave um, to see the speed at which he rides the wave and his approach. It's just like, what? I, just, I just don't have that, you know, like, and I probably will never have that. And I can make these incremental improvements in my life, uh, but I'm okay with that. You know, there are things that I am better than him at, um, and that's totally cool. Do you think Nat just takes more in from the present moment? Do you think that's why he's better in that situation? I think that he, from a very early age, uh, spent a lot of time getting better, and he learned how to learn at a, at a really young age. He was the guy who would paddle out and he would not go in until he learned that trick. Um, and he was also the guy who, from a very young age, would focus on surfing bad waves um, when the rest of us were just surfing right-hand point breaks. Um, and that allowed him to gain a lot more versatility in his um, approach and his ability to ride a, a bunch of different waves. I think he's also... Um, He's just a gamer with whatever he does. He, whether it's surfing or ping pong or Monopoly, like when we were kids, we, like we would pick up a new game every couple weeks. And he, within a couple weeks, he would be the best at it. 
it wouldn't matter what it was. He would just spend more time figuring it out, uh, and then he would and then he would become the best, and he would move on to the next thing. Um, so I've always really respected that about him. Hmm. He's got a lot of grit. Do you think that he's able to focus more deeply um, than others? More of a general question. Yeah. The, the, the surfers who are on that next level. Right. Do you think they just have next level focus? Um, I think it's a combination of things. Um, I, th I think that there's um, a huge amount it has to do with grit and how far you're willing to go to become really good. Um, I think that a lot of it has to do... Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Like that, that question of like what makes people good at things, what makes people world-class at, at things. Um, and I th yeah, I, th I would say that a, a huge amount of it has to do with, with grit and also uh, talent too. Like some people just have it. They, they're in rhythm with the ocean and the people who have never really had to work on their styles, they're the ones who, who just have that rhythm um, and hats off to them who can really the ones who have that connection. Um, and we all see those people, the, um, you know, the Dan Malloy's, um, the, someone who can just ride any piece of equipment and make it look beautiful. And they can tell, you know, you can tell that they're not thinking in the same way as, uh, as someone like me is, is constantly, uh, kind of figuring it out but uh, what do you think I, I think it's the more I look into it I yeah. think it's you know about flow states sure and you know time slows down you see things in more detail I think all athletes have the ability or all the, the better the athlete the better the ability to go deeper into flow states where time slows down even more where they notice more um, I mean, you take, we've all heard Kelly Slater in a post-heat interview, he describes th things that we can't even see when we're watching the slow motion replay. Right. He saw some warble in the wave that you can't even see it on the replay. Or I've heard him describe that he didn't like a photo of his because of the way his little finger was held through a turn so he was working on what he was doing with his hands through a turn like the level of detail and awareness is just so much more right intense and, and focused yeah I uh, I had the chance to have Mick Fanning on my podcast and he was talking about how one thing that really changed for him during uh, a season was he started visualizing uh, upcoming events after workouts. He would do a really difficult workout and then when he was sweaty and exhausted and Chopu was coming up next, he would sit down and he would think about dropping into a wave there and he would think about where his hands were and he would think about what the wave would be doing and how it would feel to get spit out of a big barrel. And then he said that when he went to an event like Chopu, he felt like time would slow down in a way that he could um, he could notice more because he had visualized it uh, before. Hmm. So I think that yeah, a huge amount of it is is detail and a, and a big part of it too is is visualization. How much do you really believe in yourself? How much do you truly know that you can do it? Uh, and that ebbs and flows with every athlete. You know, it's it's rare that a professional surfer doesn't at least have uh, a year where they bobble um, and then get it back. Um, but I think that a lot of that has to do with confidence and belief. And when we can engineer states through visualization, um, that tends to really help. Because mm. your body doesn't know the difference. If, you, yeah. if, you, if you're really thinking about dropping into that wave and pulling into the barrel exactly the way you want to, when you go out and do it, uh, your body thinks, oh, I've been here before. 
Mm. Yeah, and that relaxes the brain and then flow states flow. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, when I think of the the best waves I've surfed, it's always been where time slowed down the most. Yeah. Um, and I've you know, I've had that confirmed through footage. I've seen footage of, wow, it felt like I was surfing so fast and it looked horrible. And then I think, well, that wave felt slow, but it looked better. But I was more detailed and time was slowed down for me. I saw more. And this one big thing that I learned from Tom Carroll interviewing him is he said, you've got to look for the details. We yeah. were talking about surfing small waves. I was like, because I saw him he's, you know, in his 50s and we went surfing and he was just doing roundhouse cutbacks on these little knee-high waves. And I was just, I couldn't even catch the waves. And it just it just blew my mind, and I thought, how? And he said, it's the details. He's looking at what the wind chop's doing, what the secondary swell's doing, what the backwash is doing. Just he's so focused on the the now. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Well, they say that uh, if you learn how to surf a small wave, then you can surf a big wave, but not vice versa. And that's probably because there's so much detail that is put in that happens when you're surfing a two foot slop. You're really looking for those little energy pockets because the wave's not pushing you along um, with this infinite amount of energy where you can surf a big wave and like wherever you put, put yourself, the wave's going to continue to push you along. Um, but there is that kind of detail in noticing how to surf a small wave and, Oh, God, sure are hard. Yeah. God, I, uh, I'm i always just so impressed with people who can go at that speed. I think that that's the difference between a good surfer and a great surfer. Like, you, you don't really see it when you're looking at the replays um, or when you're looking on, like, on TV uh, at the events because all the surfers are, are surfing so fast, you don't have anything to compare it to. Yeah. But man, if you're out surfing your home break and Mick Fanning paddles out, whoo wee, that guy's going at a different speed than everyone else. Yeah. It's amazing. It's my, especially when the waves are tiny and just everyone's struggling to catch the waves on their fat boards and a pro comes out on this little paper thin wafer and just tears it apart. It's so, it's amazing. Yeah. They make surfing look like it can be so much more fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's what drives me to get better. Like, I'm not a competitor, and most of the listeners aren't. And, right. You know, they just want to get better at surfing the bad waves they surf every day and to get better so that they can go to Uluwatu or so they can go and surf cloud break. Right. They want to get better so they can create those opportunities to surf these waves and maybe one day get a stand-up barrel. Yeah, I think that... Uh, one key to happiness is setting short-term goals for yourself and achieving them. Mm. It allows us to uh, break life down into daily chunks and it helps me to not get so overwhelmed. Right? I, I have this, this uh, practice that I do every day where I think about three things that would make my day great in the morning. I write them down and then in the evening, I say I, I write down what are three great things that happened today and what are three things I could have done better. And that simple practice allows me to make smaller circles in my life. And when it comes to surfing, I, I respect what you do because you are helping people break it down. And it, uh, it getting better doesn't seem so amorphous and big when you can um, point out the details for people. And I've, I've started to do, to do that with my surfing too. I'll, before I paddle out now, um, I really set expectations for myself. And I will think, okay, today's going to be a good session if I catch three good waves. Or today's going to be a good session if I um, get a barrel. Or know anything I, I and I set different expectations based on the day mm. uh, so they're realistic so they're realistic yeah and I mean my my expectation for paddling out at a crowded wave point break in Santa Cruz is usually like okay I'm gonna catch three waves and then I'm gonna go in uh 
whereas like you know Mavericks is a wave where I'm constantly needing to recalibrate my expectations because it can be really it, it can not only be disappointing to to set too high of expectations but it can be really dangerous too um so f like a way of like like mavericks and expectation that i might set for myself um is to um focus on my breath the whole session like just something to make it that small that i have something to focus on i heard a really good tennis player once say that they um when they feel overwhelmed and it's match point, they think about their feet. And I always really like that. Anything that we can do to make it smaller and more manageable can allow us to move through the experience with more grace. Yeah, bring it back to the body rather than lost in thought. Because if you're lost in thought, you lose your focus and you miss the wave or you get caught on the side. Yeah, yeah. Just don't want to be asleep at the wheel. Yeah. It's amazing how difficult it is to hold focus. It is. <laughs> Gosh, we like our minds. You ever see that uh, uh, Simpsons episode where Marge is like, Homer, are you even listening to me? And then it goes inside Homer's brain, <laughs> and it's this monkey with tambourines going, Ch -ch 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 -ch. I yeah. sometimes feel like that yeah. in most of my life. <laughs> I think we all do. <clears throat> I liked your hunting analogy before because I grew up hunting. Oh, you did? And that's one thing like you might go for a four hour walk and if you're as soon as you get lost in thought that's when the animal runs in front of you and it's gone yeah and you learn that very quickly yeah so you have to be always aware of the wind how you're walking what are you looking for and it seems like hunting is like something so primal within us that it it's for me at least it's easier to have that kind of hyper focus when I'm hunting because it seems it's more primal I guess Whereas surfing is so, I mean, it's just surfing really, isn't it? It's just catching some waves. Like hunting's primal in us. You know, if we didn't get that animal, we couldn't feed our family. It's ingrained in our neurology. So I think if you can bring that hyper focus to your surfing, that's what I'm learning more nowadays. Because I did a hunting trip recently in New Zealand and kind of just reminded me of that hyper focus that happens almost naturally. Maybe it's because I grew up or maybe it's the primal instinct, but I've been bringing that hyper-awareness into my surfing and really hunting waves, mm. hunting the details. And I'm finding that is getting me into the flow more. Yeah. What so, were you hunting? Uh, deer. Deer. Yeah. They have axis deer out there? Or no, it? what you would call elk here, I guess, red deer. Yep. We call them in New Zealand. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I hear there's very good hunting and uh fishing out there as well. Mm -hmm. I have a, a friend named Justin Lee who's a Hawaiian spear fisherman. He took a trip out to New Zealand and he sent me this photo of this school of yellowtail circling around him and he's about to take his drop. Wow. And it's this aerial photo of hundreds of yellowtail circling around. I'd really like to get out there. Yeah. Oh, it's paradise. Yeah. yeah it's so um, untouched. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fun to... Um, also, like, I'm not very good at hunting, so it stays new for me. Like, there is this point of exponential learning that happens when you start a a new skill. Um, whereas surfing, it's like, at this point, like, it's, it's very small details. Like, for me to get 1% better at surfing is way more difficult than it is for me to get 1% better at hunting. Because it's just, it's so new for me. Like, I, I'm just taking it all in. I'm a beginner again. And um, I always find that when I become crotchety, uh, it's time for me to learn a new skill, find something that I suck at and get better at it. So that's why going back to surfing, that's quite like jumping on a single fin kind of gives you that new totally feeling. yeah yeah because i'm like and longboarding too man i've um I, I oscillate between santa cruz and la and i just got this beautiful nine six longboard shaped by a guy named travis reynolds and i keep it down here and i've been surfing malibu and i've never really been a longboarder but man it's fun yeah oh my gosh just going straight and trimming on a wave uh is such a blast and i and it's like 
I suck at longboarding. Like I can do it, but I'm not like expected to be good at it at all. Um, which, uh, allows me to get better more quickly because I don't have any, uh, any ego attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. I started longboarding six months ago too. And I wish I had started earlier. Oh my God. So, yeah. So good. All, all the little hipster kids had it figured out from day one. Yeah. And it's so good for your shortboarding too, because as soon as you jump on a shortboard, it's like, oh. Yeah. Well, it keeps it fun, right? At any time, uh, like, think about like relationships in that way. Like, any time you're in a relationship with someone and it becomes repetitive, and it and and you begin to take your partner for granted. Ooh, you're in trouble. You'll hear about it. You'll hear about it. And if you really want to keep that relationship spicy, you're constantly doing new experiences together. You're saying new things. You're writing love letters. You're, you're doing whatever you can to keep that newness and that romance alive. So whatever I can do to keep the romance in surfing alive, I will do. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think I—I I, I mean, I've been a little bit guilty in the past of keeping it too scientific and too clinical. Yeah. Whereas you got to you got to throw some creativity in there as well. Yeah. Like just get an old longboard, learn how to ride it. Yeah. I, I mean, look, we're not designing the Hubble telescope here. If we're not engineers, surfing is an art, and there's a beauty to it, and it's one of the most pointless activities ever. What are we doing? We're going out, and we're surfing a couple waves for absolutely no reason. Like, what? If aliens came down, and they were to look at human surfing, they'd probably think it was pretty cool because it is so pointless, and we better keep that joy and that romance involved. Otherwise... Uh, Otherwise, we're just robots. Yeah, it is pointless. But what has what has surfing taught you about things that aren't pointless? Um. Whew, well, uh, and now we're getting into some some very deep questions ar around the point of life and why are we even here? Uh, you know, we're here for. 80 or 90 years if we're lucky we're going to meet some people we're going to have some experiences uh that are going to teach us about ourselves um we're either going to leave the campsite a little bit nicer than we found it or we're not and then we're going to be gone and everyone we know is going to be gone and everyone that they know is going to be gone and everything that we've ever said is probably going to be forgotten and made obsolete at a certain point so why are we here what's what is the real point you could say that surfing is one of the most profoundly meaningful experiences because we are dancing with nature we are uh we are really immersing ourselves in the natural world in a way that we rarely get to do so from a value standpoint um i value our natural world and many surfers do there's a reason why so many surfers are environmentalists because we interact with nature on such a deep level um and meaning um, can be brought to our lives in many ways. And as I said before, I sometimes feel like the meaning of my life is just to notice more. And surfing is a really beautiful way for me to notice more. So I don't mean to say that uh, that surfing is meaningless, but I like to I like to throw that out there because. Um, life is so important. We better not take it too seriously. It's, it's. It, I think it's the meaningless of surfing that allows us to experiment. And there's no con. If you're not surfing big waves, there's not really any consequences to trying a new board or trying a new technique. And it, like you alluded to, it, it teaches you to have that, um, have that same mindset in other areas of your life. Yeah. So surfing can almost be like the the testing ground for. Yeah, absolutely, man. It keeps us sane. Yeah, I, I surf more for my <laughs> more for my uh, mental state than I do for my physical state. I'm just being able to get out there and get in the ocean and dive underwater. And even something as as um, like I started spearfishing uh, two years ago, and 
I go spearfish waves that I've surfed my entire life, but now I'm looking at the reef in from a new perspective that I've never seen before. I have this new target. And it's I always have to chuckle because I'm going to the exact same spot that I've gone my entire life, but it's this completely new experience by shifting that goal just a little bit, even though I'm in the same environment. And that's what's so freaking cool about the ocean is that we can experience it in any capacity that we want forever. I'm going to be 90 years old just floating out there, naked, saggy, can't stand up on a wave, but I'll be on my boogie board, riding into shore, still enjoying it. Yeah. Awesome. Any final words? Um, Final words? Man, um, no, I enjoy enjoy this conversation. It's fun to geek out on surfing and, uh, you know... Get out in the water every single day. I, I, I think that that's the best thing that we can do. It's church out there. So g- get out, even if you're on a boogie board or you're swimming or you're just getting into surfing or if you're the best surfer in the world listening to this. You know, m- when you think about planet Earth, it's mostly water. We're here on these little patches of dirt. And to be able to just pay that kind of respect and understanding that we really do live on a blue planet. We live on a water planet. So let's experience it as fully as possible. I think is cool. I like having that thought as much as possible. Cool. Kyle, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks for being a part of it. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to the Surf Mastery Podcast. Again, I'm your host, Michael Frampton. Make sure you subscribe so you can keep up to date with the latest interviews. Please share with your friends. Check us out uh, on Facebook at uh, Surf Mastery Surf. And if you're on iTunes, please go and give us a little rating. That'd be awesome. Until next time, keep surfing.